But it's lovely to see you guys and lovely to see the gompa over there at Kunsong Yeshi. Um, so um, we'll go ahead and start with um, refuge in Bodhicitta. So for any of you who aren't uh, identified as Buddhist, you can just reconnect with your own spiritual refuge and your altruistic motivation in the way that feels um, like it resonates for you. All right, so we'll just take a minute all together. I sang a chudon so gichun abla, John Chupadu dani capsuchi, Dagi chun yen gi pe sonam ki, Roll up and cheer sang a drupa show. Sang a chudon so gichun abla, John Chupadu dani capsuchi. Dagi chun yen ki pe sonam ki, roll up and cheer sang a drupa show. Sang a chudon so ki chun abla, jan chu padu dani gapsu chi. Dagi chun yen ki pe sonam ki, roll up and cheer sang a drupa show. Okay. So um, really, I'm sure most of us are already doing this course for both ourselves and for others. Um, but just to kind of really click that into your mind that again and again, all of the internal work we do with ourself, it has a direct benefit on how much we're able to benefit other people. And the more we're motivated to be of benefit to other people, the more we're going to benefit ourselves as well. And so just kind of keep coming back to that again and again of I'm in particular, preparing for my own death, because that will help me prepare for the deaths of others, because that will help me support others as they go through the dying process. And it means also that when I actually die, it's going to be an opportunity, it's going to be an adventure, rather than something to be feared. So, um, so all of these reasons pervade the whole concept for going over this topic. Um, I'm guessing that some of you are feeling your own impending death and some of you are feeling um, you know the deaths of maybe your parents or other loved ones that you might need to be supporting and um, some combination as well but um, if we come back to the premise that we know and love um, especially if you've been to Buddhist classes before which is that death is certain <laughs> the time of death is uncertain and at the time of death, the only thing that's going to really help is your own internal development. So if you were to read this from the Lam Rim Chenmo, it would say only the Dharma is of benefit. But what that really means is the safety you've given yourself through your own mental training. Um, friends and family will try to help. Doctors and nurses will try to help. They may or not be helpful. <laughs> right? They may or may not be helpful. Um, they will be going through their own process. So what we really have to rely on is our own mental development. And the type of mental development we want is something in accordance with the Dharma, isn't it? Something that's altruistic and is thinking to benefit others. So <laughs> with that in mind, we're going to be doing some um, kind of like light logistics that if you think about them too deeply, they'll really hit home with your own mortality. Um, it's okay to kind of touch them lightly, like it's just kind of a fun project, like let's design our funeral, that'll be fun, what's my playlist? And then you sit with it and you go, oh, good heavens, people will be listening to this after I'm dead. This is kind of a message I'm leaving to people after I die. Oh my goodness, that's actually a profound kind of thought. Um, and so just kind of notice yourself navigate in between treating this content in a kind of logistical tick list, get organized, get kind of oriented sort of way, as well as in the kind of deep, profound poignancy of someday we're leaving this body, someday the people we love are leaving the bodies we're used to seeing them in, and it's not the end, but it is still poignant. Yeah, it's not the end, but it, it still is something that, that touches our heart, and um, while all of this is a grand adventure, and while all of this has great opportunity, it's okay to recognize the sadness as well that comes with talking about and thinking about this topic. 
So if you can really make sure that you're maintaining self-awareness as you listen to this project, yeah, as you listen to this class, because if you can do that, you'll notice if you're starting to get a bit wobbly, you know, a bit of grief coming up or a bit of emotions coming up or um, you start getting irritable for no particular reason or you start getting hungry and attached for no particular reason and then you think, oh, the content is actually getting to me a little bit. I need to really come back to my spiritual refuge, but I also need to rely on my friends and family and, and not try to tough it out or soldier on. You know, if you need to talk to someone during or after this course, um, please don't kind of do a stiff upper lip thing. I'm talking to you, Australia, but <laughs> everyone else as well. Um, you know, just make sure that you look after each other. Because, you know, you can be kind of breezy about it, like, yeah, Buddhists talk about death all the time, do to do just one of many topics. Or you can be like, oh my god, I never really thought about this, I really am going to die, you know. Usually what gets to us is the thought of losing people we love. Our, our own death, we have a, you know, kind of variable relationship with, but what usually gets you is if you think about people you love passing. So all these different levels are going to be touched and just allow yourself to kind of roll through being sometimes flippant, sometimes dark humor, some jokes, you know, that are just kind of a little bit inappropriate, but are your tension releasing. And then sometimes maybe some tears, maybe some uh, needing to withdraw and not be around people, just kind of be okay with your reactions and your responses to this material. You know, be nice to yourself about it. And, um, Try not to do any spiritual bypassing or jumping over your reaction to the reaction you think you should have. Yeah, we all know that we can transform anything onto the path to enlightenment. We all know that everything can be fuel for bodhicitta. However, in the moment, you just might get a little bit um, overwhelmed or a little bit dissociated or distracted or a bit kind of, as I said, irritable that can come up because there's part of us that really doesn't want to look at death. Um, for poignant reasons, yes, but also for reasons to do with laziness. Um, if we really remembered that we were gonna die, a lot of our everyday habits would be embarrassing. Yeah, so if you put off thinking about your death, then you can binge watch a whole series on Netflix right? <laughs> but if you're remembering death and you're picturing yourself on your deathbed, are you going to think, oh, I wish I'd watched all four seasons? You know, like, is that going to be one of your regrets? Or is it going to be, oh, gee, I wish I'd, you know, spent more time with my family, or I wish I'd given more energy to deep conversations, or, you know, that kind of stuff. So if you remember death, a lot of your attachment habits show themselves to you, and it's a little bit confronting and embarrassing. And so it's better not to think about death because then you don't have to change. And yet death's gonna come anyway, isn't it? And there you are with all of your habits going, oh gosh, I wish I hadn't wasted my life or I wish I hadn't wasted my health years, you know? So just kind of um, all of this stuff is just gonna kind of float around and digest in a way that's gonna be at your own speed but um, notice and be aware of your reactions to this content, as well as trying to process the content. Yeah. Okay, so, um, so I made you a little PowerPoint because you know I like to write on the whiteboard, but we have no whiteboard. Or if I typed on the Zoom whiteboard, it's a bit awkward. So I made you a PowerPoint because I'm a little bit of a nerd. Um, but I'll go back and forth between um, just chatting and then things that are more visual. So don't worry, it's not going to be tons of reading. And if you can't read the screen from where you are, don't worry, I'll um, read out what it says anyway. Okay, so we're going to switch to a PowerPoint and just start kind of going through what we're going to be looking at in this course. So the first thing we're going to be looking at is um, in preparing for our own death. Of course, we're remembering that that helps in assisting others. But for ourselves, we need to look at kind of a twofold approach, inner work and outer behaviors. And of course, they go together. Um, but just kind of framing it in that way can help you get a bit organized. And then when you're preparing for the deaths of loved ones, here we're really thinking about how to help them through the process. The, the grief and loss kind of side of it, the bereavement side of it, um, we'll talk about a little bit next week. 
Um, but this week we're going to talk more about just kind of getting organized for the process of dying. The aftermath is something that we'll deal with next week. So what we want to be looking at are ways to support introspection, as well as just outer logistics and connections. And so um, anything that you're really kind of familiar with and doing for your own process is going to make it a lot easier to talk about when you look after someone else. And then um, for all of us, I think it's interesting to start having this idea of purpose projects, things like autobiographies or things like legacy planning to really um, keep death in the forefront our, in our mind as a way to motivate ourselves about what it is we want to leave after us. Yeah, not just the legacy you want to leave your own mental continuum in terms of positive habits moving towards enlightenment, but in terms of what you're actually going to leave behind from this particular life. So it might not be an autobiography, it might be, you know, teaching someone your special gardening techniques, you know, but just kind of thinking about those things, these purpose projects are actually very joyful and empowering. So we'll talk a little bit about that. So then we're going to go through the death process and the benefit of looking at the death process. And some of you guys know about these eight stages at the time of death. What I'm hoping is that we can get so familiar with what happens at the eight stages at the time of death that it's memorized, that it's so familiar that you could kind of walk yourself through it one by one without anything in front of you. Um, it's also very useful to know these stages if you're someone who's going to practice highest yoga tantra. So kind of put a pin in that of, it's not just useful for um, the sutra path, but it's also useful for the tantra path. The nine point death meditation is um, what I gave you the abbreviated version of at the top of the class, which was death is certain, the time of death is uncertain, and at the time of death only the Dharma is of use, meaning your own internal development. And, Sometimes this is a good morning motivator. Yeah, just kind of like, right, okay, I know I'm going to die, but I actually have no idea when. Yeah, healthy people die before sick people every day. And young people die before old people every day. And I've known that all of my adult life and most of my childhood. And yet, I act as if I'm going to live forever. And in so doing, I waste a lot of time. So, um, you know, if it's going <laughs> to trigger you into a spiral of doom, um, you know, therapy first, then nine point death meditation. But if it's going to be motivating, then this can be something that can be a really useful meditation to be familiar with. Um, and then planning for your death practices, your funeral and, and sort of distribution of your possessions. Um, this is something that we're not going to do during the class time, but I've given you some exercises in your course materials so you can kind of start getting on top of that and um, start making some plans. Then um, more importantly is organizing your inner life. And of course, you know, the eight stages are related to inner experiences, but the logistics of just getting used to them is kind of like a study project. Now internally, most important is connecting with your spiritual refuge. So this begs the question, what is your spiritual refuge? Um, and, you know, if you don't have one, uh, think about that. <laughs> Make one, connect with one, deepen that. Um, it doesn't have to be a Buddhist refuge, of course, but without kind of an inner orientation of what is the point of all this and what is my place within that, death is harder and scarier, and so is life. And then um, we want to look a little bit at examining our life so far, deciding what to do more of and what to do less of. Yeah, so purifying past mistakes so that we can drop some of our guilt baggage and rejoicing in past beneficial actions to kind of feel like actually already, even if I died today, there was a lot of meaning and purpose in my life. I maybe just forgot to frame it that way and celebrate it and, you know, and it's something important and joyful to do. Um, it also makes you more likely to continue those positive habits. And then, as I said, purpose projects like autobiography, etc. So we'll be going more into that as time goes by. Okay. So getting familiar with the eight stages, these eight stages are in your course materials, but we want to be also aware of them from the observer perspective. 
Yeah. So when you're preparing for the death of loved ones, you want to know what to watch for. So when you're watching the eight stages, there's obvious physical signs. When you're experiencing the eight stages, there's of course kind of um, mental visualizations that occur as well as kind of a physiological experience that you have. But it's good to know, you know, what should I be looking for if I'm with someone? Usually the only thing we know is to listen for like the death rattle, right? When, if you've ever been with someone who's dying, you can really hear a change in their breathing if they're very close to the end. You know, there's kind of a short in-breath and a long out-breath and it's kind of raggedy. And often um, their mouth is open and they're breathing just through their mouth, not through their nose. You know, this is in a kind of, um, quote, ordinary death, not something um, to do with a, an emergency situation or an illness. Um, so we know that one, but it's nice to know some of the earlier stages because that can help us reconnect the person that we're with to things that will bring them peace. So then... We're going to look at some death and dying practices that you can offer during and after the death. Um, and some of those we'll do next week, but just to kind of get you organized on what we're up to. And supporting connections to other people's inner life and outer relationships. So here we're supporting whatever is their positive spiritual refuge or secular ethical connection, right? Um, this is so important. What is theirs? Not yours, not what you think it should be, not what you hope it is, but what actually do you think is their refuge? And, um, you know, I often tell the story of um, when I was with one of my grandfathers when he was dying, and I knew that his spiritual refuge was quite abstract. <laughs> it was sort of related to nature in some way. He was an old cowboy. He was an old rancher. And um, when I told him I was going to be a nun years ago, he said, oh, honey, that's real nice. I never had much religion myself. <laughs> you know, big sky cathedral for me. And so I knew that about my grandfather. So I wasn't going to do all sorts of weird Buddhist stuff when he was dying. We were going to talk about nature. We we're going to do poems about nature. And, um, and I knew that he was okay enough with Buddhism that I could recite accessible Buddhist prayers. So for him, I wasn't going to do something like the Guru Puja in Tibetan chanting. <laughs> for him, I did the Medicine Buddha Puja in English, and I gave special attention to the prayers um, that go with each Buddha because they're so beautiful and they're so accessible and you don't have to be Buddhist to connect with them. You know? And I knew him well enough to know he wouldn't mind that kind of thing. With my other grandfather, he was Catholic, so I wouldn't have even done that. I would have done the Lord's Prayer or something. You know, so it's just kind of reading the room, you know, as well. So who's the person dying? Who's the people around the person dying? You know, and are we going to be triggering family dramas by imposing our plan on the situation? Because the most important thing is to create an atmosphere in an environment where the person who is dying feels at peace and feels connection, but also feels okay to let go. So if there's a whole family drama, they're going to feel some agitation because of that. So you might go in with a nice plan, but have to adjust it once you're in the room. So make sure that, you know, you have that in the back of your mind. It's, it's so important to read the room. Um, things you can do when people are still quite lucid is rejoicing in their past beneficial actions. Buddhists know that this increases their merit, and that's a wonderful thing. Even if you don't think in those terms, taking intentional walks down memory lane uplifts them. Often um, people, especially if they've had chronic illness, they kind of forget, and, you know, and they can start to feel like, what's the point? My life's been a waste because the last, you know, two to five years have been battling cancer and that's been consuming their whole life. They forget all the years before that when they did remarkable things. So reminding them of that on purpose intentionally you know, not in a manipulative, weird way, in a way that makes sense for your relationship, but to really think, okay, what's a memory we share that they're going to love to revisit and plan on talking about that. Yeah. So it's this thing of really with anything in Buddhism and anything in spiritual practice where it's important to have a plan. It's important to know why you have your plan. And it's also very important to be ready to let go of your plan. Yeah.
Um, because in the moment, your plan might not be the right thing. So if you have too much of a concrete agenda of what you're going to do at the bedside of someone, then you might not realize they're a bit too tired to hear it that day. That day, they just need some folk music. <laughs> you know, that day, they just need, you know, some massage or something. So, um, you know, it's, it it's, gives you security and mental peace to have a plan so you don't feel like, oh, God, what am I going to say? Have a plan before you go, but also be ready to let go of that plan. Adjust. Okay, and then facilitating their purpose projects. So um, if they want to do autobiography, legacy planning, lesson sharing, forgiveness receiving and requesting, that kind of thing, you know, if they're open to it, if it seems like it'll make them happy, you know, just kind of like offer that. Um, you know, one of the benefits of our super smartphones is, you know, the audio recording function sometimes people don't have the energy to write or to type, you can just record them telling stories. And I tell you what, you know, five years down the track, you listen to one of those stories that your loved one who is now passed, and you hear their voice. It just is so touching. Yeah, and I think it really makes them happy to know that they've left that behind. So in kind of preparing yourself for death, I think it's helpful to remember that we already know how to navigate significant transitions. We, we already are able to do this kind of um, inner work, this inner adjustment when unexpected things happen. These, quote, bardos or intermediate states. It's important to revisit them and think, actually, death is just one of many examples of impermanence. It's just one of many examples of change. And often I have resisted change and often that resistance has made things harder. <laughs> what are the times when I went with the flow and I accepted the fact and the truth that things are changing all the time and it actually became a really joyful process because of that letting go and easing into the movement that's already there. So, you know, if you're really feeling like, I don't want this to happen, I don't want this to happen for me, for them, etc., just kind of coming back to in the past when I've had that really illusion that stability is possible and that hanging on to a concrete idea of when I thought I needed things to be a certain way, how that very process itself made life a lot harder. Yeah. So if you can break the illusion of stability <laughs> and realize you were okay, even when things were flowing in a way you weren't expecting, it reinforces your resilience. Yeah. And then we're going to look at the actual bardo, um, the intermediate state that lasts, um, you know, up to 49 days between death and rebirth. Um, for you as an individual navigating kind of these dreamlike visions that happen in the bardo. And then for others, practices that boost merit and guide them through that process. So, And then um, next week, we're going to go into a little bit more about grief, if it's something you're interested in. And so I'll, I'll ask you guys for some feedback at the end of the next session and see if that's a direction you want to go, or if you'd rather go into the direction of learning more prayers and practices um, for dealing with um, the loss of someone after they've passed. So kind of which direction you guys prefer can, can dictate where we go with this. But the brief one to look at is grief that is not particularly functional, but is very common. Okay, so just really gently, we're going we're gonna to take a little pause here and look at grief, just so that it's kind of on our radar of, it's not against Buddhism to deal with your baggage, Buddhism is dealing with your baggage, <laughs> okay? It's just not identifying with your baggage. So we want to accept grief that arises with really huge compassion for ourselves. Yeah, whatever our response is, we want to be really accepting and compassionate of that, while at the same time very gently challenging what is going on behind the scenes of this experience. So... Some of the grief that happens is in anticipation of loss. And some of this is seeming like you're saying to the person who is dying, I love you so much, I need to show you that I'm sad that you're dying. However, it's actually a story about you 
and you're losing something that you want to be there. And it's actually a little bit like objectification, you know, like a kid losing their toy. And that sounds very superficial. And we don't want to admit that we think of people in relationships in this way. And of course, we don't quite as superficially as that. But some of the grief that we experience is, I gave all the power to this external thing to give or take happiness. And now it has that power. And so thinking about it going is freaking me out. And if you kind of let yourself get indulged into that behavior, it's harder to companion someone through their dying process. It's harder to be present because you've made it about you. So these are just kind of things to like wake up in your radar because I'm guessing all of us have seen this in other people and maybe judge them a little bit because of it. Um, but if we can see it within ourselves, it's going to make us less judgmental for our fellow grievers. And it's going to make us a lot more self-aware the next time it might happen. Okay. So then we have, um, you know, related to this is the grief that's overly personalized. You've made the story of someone else's illness all about you. Yeah. Um, you know, someone is passing, they've got cancer, they've got this diagnosis or that diagnosis. And now your ego is saying, I have a genuine reason to get the attention I've always wanted. Yeah. That's what your ego kind of co-ops the moment and says, how many people can I tell about this and get positive, you know, sort of support because of it? When in fact, before the whole story of losing someone, you were really feeling quite lonely or isolated or you were feeling unrecognized or unsupported. And there were ways to get more support in kind of mature adult ways, but you hadn't done it. And now this grief situation is happening and the ego says, now's your chance. People will love you now if you tell them how much you're struggling. Yeah, so what we want to do is to say, all right, that's normal and natural and not necessarily functional. Normal and natural just means habit, doesn't mean wise. Yeah, so, so just kind of like being on top of that. Yeah, because again, if you're companioning someone through their dying process, it's going to be harder on them if they have to walk you through your grief of losing them. Yeah. Um, and then the grief that sometimes happens after someone passes away that is normal and natural, but not particularly functional, is a show of grief. Because you want people to know that the person who left was significant. And of course they were significant, but you crying and raving and doing all sorts of behaviors that are unskillful is not going to make them more valuable and not necessarily going to make other people celebrate them either. So if you can kind of notice your, if yourself is wanting to do that and ask, okay, what's a functional way to do this? You know, if I'm crying, if I'm ranting online, if I'm doing this and doing that, that's actually a bit dysfunctional. There's some wisdom at the core, which is saying, this person was important and now they're gone. What can I do to honor and celebrate their life? You know, rather than, you know, kind of be messy about it, be organized about it. Because um, I think also the grief will roll through in a lot healthier way that way. And you don't kind of get stuck in kind of weird habits that can occur when you've got a grief excuse. So then we have the grief that is reliving or compounded by previous loss or current stress. Um, sometimes you'll see this with like the death of celebrities, where um, maybe it's some musician you loved in your youth and now they've died and you're just shattered. You haven't listened to their music in years, you, you know, you kind of have forgotten, but now they've died and you're like, oh man, they were so meaningful. They were so profound to the movement. Look at these lyrics. And you're really like in it. It could be that actually your life is quite stressful right now. And that's been the excuse for an outlet, which is fine, right? Like, but know that because otherwise you think, oh, wow, it meant so much to me that they passed away and you'll miss the wisdom in that response, which is saying, oh, I've gotten myself a bit stressed out. All it took was this random figure from my youth who I never met to leave, and now suddenly I'm all full of emotion. What do I need to do to have less stress in my life or to manage my stress differently? 
Um, and yeah, that musician was great. However, <laughs> you know, why, why this is the question, you know, of all the millions of celebrities who die, why did this one get to me? You know, or it's like an acquaintance who passed away and you sort of knew them 10 years ago and, you know, whatever, you had an interesting conversation and now they're dead and you see it in the obituary and you're having a whole series of responses. And, you know, why? There's a million acquaintances who die and you go, oh, what a shame, they were lovely. Anyway, right? So asking yourself, why this? Why now? Yeah. And then grief that is an excuse for bad behavior and like slips of mindfulness. Um, it's like you kind of get a free pass for bad behavior in the early stages of grief. Yeah, and you might, you know, drink too much or um, be a bit brusque with people and they'll accept that and forgive you because they know that you're grieving. And then you get used to it. And then it becomes a habit. And then it's really hard to change. And you can even develop a story of excusing your bad behavior because you've experienced a loss. So really hear this as invitations for self-awareness. Yeah, this is all invitations for self-awareness and self-examination. Meet whatever arises with just great kindness and go, oh goodness, I do go that way sometimes. And that's normal and there's a more skillful way to bring this on the path to awakening. And if I can recognize it honestly within myself, then I'll see it in others without being judgmental. If I recognize it within myself with an ego lens, then when I see it in others, I'll judge them and say, oh, I used to do that, but I don't anymore. How can they still do that? Why won't they grow up? And you'll get all these kind of weird judgment thoughts showing you that you haven't really dealt with your stuff. So these are just some invitations to explore, um, but we'll revisit grief next week if, if that's something that's of interest to you. Right now, these are just kind of um, a rough outline of things to look at. Okay, so um, external activities. Now we're shifting to logistics. So if your emotions were starting to arise and you were all in your feelings, just kind of go, <sighs> okay, now logistics. Oh, yay, I love logistics. Okay, um, so just shifting a little bit. External activities can make you feel stable. Um, you know, the Christian saying, you know, men make plans and God laughs, right? <laughs> um, you can make your plans. They may not come to fruition. But remember that everything in Buddhism is about developing mental habits. And if you develop mental habits that are positive going in plans like this, then even if the plans don't come to fruition or don't finish, what you've done is created a pattern and a pathway of wanting to think of others and wanting to think altruistically. And so the plan doesn't even wind up mattering. And if the plan comes about, that's a bonus and that's great. But just kind of view it this way of these are fun logistics to go through, you know, fun in a morbid Buddhist way, right? Fun logistics to go through, but don't assume that they'll all come about because um, life's not that tidy, is it? Okay, <laughs> so um, these are the three kind of pieces we're going to look at is generosity, um, funeral planning, and purpose projects. Okay, so generosity that really means what will make your mind happy in thinking about where your money and possessions will go. Yeah, what's going to make your mind happy? Um, you have to write it down and you have to tell people. You really do. Um, if you are one of those people that says, oh, I don't really care. You guys just sort it out when I die. I don't mind. You just sort it out. It actually puts a lot of pressure on the people who are left behind. It's actually a great kindness to say, my china goes to my kids and my silverware goes to my nephews and my, you know, it's, it's actually a kindness because it means that people aren't going to have awkwardness and arguments after you pass away. So if you think, oh, I don't, I'm not really materialistic, whatever, just, you know, whatever you guys sort it out. It, it's nicer if you actually just tell them what you'd like <laughs> happen. Yeah. Um, particularly with your money, particularly if you have children, um, as transparent as you can be about that so that they don't get surprises and shocks. <laughs> and what can you give away while you're still alive? 
Because that's more fun, right? Because then you can be like, look, and they're like, yay, you know, and you can tell them the story of it. You can say, here's this teacup, and they're like, well, it's pretty. But if you tell them why it's important to you, then they see that teacup and they're reminded of the beautiful story and they're reminded of you. And then even if the teacup breaks, it doesn't matter because now they have that beautiful story and connection of you. If you just kind of leave it to them randomly without any context, they might feel this whole guilt relationship with the object like, oh, I should keep this, but I'm not sure why. This was important to someone I loved, so here it is gathering dust. And then if it breaks, they feel guilt and shame and regret and all these like existential angsty things, or they sell it and then feel terrible or whatever. You know, so communication and transparency, um, it's awkward at first, and then it gets fun. You know, then it actually becomes something to really look forward to of, ah, the next time the grandkids come over, I'm going to tell them the story of this blanket and how my great grandmother made it for me. And I'm going to wrap them up in them in it and give them a big cuddle. And then again, even if they never wind up having the blanket or it gets destroyed, they have this beautiful memory of the story and you cuddling them in the blanket, you know, stuff like that. But the point here is that these things aren't going to get organized by waiting. Yeah. And the awkward conversations aren't going to get a lot less awkward by waiting. And if you kind of um, break the ice now, gently with your friends and family, very tiny things, it's going to make the conversations easier as time goes by. Yeah. And you can always start out with these things, asking people, is it okay if we talk openly about this or is it going to freak you out and say, look, I have some stuff that I want to, you know, deal with before I die. Do you feel comfortable having that conversation? Cause I'd really like to share some things with you. They might say, sure. Uh, or they might say, I'm not quite ready. Or they might say, yeah, cool. You know, but you know, just start. So, um, more important um, from a spiritual perspective, of course, is the non-material legacies that you want to share, which tie into feeling a sense of connection and purpose and really making the rest of this life, even if it's decades, feel more meaningful. And these, you don't have to tell people, I'm planning for my death. You know, you don't have to frame it that way. It's something that you know in the back of your mind. But to think, what do I want to share? You know, teaching various skills to the next generation. Yeah, um, showing favorite walking or camping spots. You know, advice that is kind and timely to your old workplaces. Um, is there a skill that really um, you spent some long years getting good at? Is it going to die with you? You know, like, is there a way to share it? That's a nice kind of thing to think about. Um, so non-material legacies. So the session after lunch, there's going to be time to do some writing exercises related to these. So don't worry, we're coming back. And then um, for funeral planning, I've given you guys kind of a rough funeral structure that's quite common for Western countries. And then you can kind of play with it and say, oh, I'd like this to go there or this to go there. But if you see the common structure, it can kind of make you feel less overwhelmed and kind of oriented. Like, oh yeah, I've seen things go like that. And I really liked it when they did this or I didn't like it when they did that. And um, so that's kind of a project to think about. And um, when you're doing this kind of funeral planning process, you know, I think it is, it's really special when people have left a letter to be read out at the funeral. I've been to a few funerals like this where one of them, it was so beautiful because it was from this like classic Australian guy who was like stiff upper lip, like really, um, you know, salt of the earth, didn't talk much, you know, really um, quiet guy, strong and silent. And he wrote this beautiful letter to his kids about how much he loved them and how much he was proud of them. And oh my goodness, the tears at that funeral, but they were like the happy, happy crying tears. Oh, it was gorgeous. And, um, you know, of course, some of those letters, write to them now, tell them now. But if it's too awkward, write your, you know, your funeral letter and tell people where to find it or give it to your lawyer and tell your lawyer to give it to so-and-so. Um, but it can be really moving. It can be really moving. Um, you know, I think other things are to think about if you're card-carrying Buddhist is what imprints 
can you leave for your relatives? Yeah, ha ha ha, like stealth imprinting. Yeah, because they might not have listened to your Buddhist nonsense while you were alive, right? But now you've got their attention. <laughs> Right. Um, so what are some uh, accessible Buddhist ideas and prayers that maybe you want to share with them? Even if it's as simple as, you know, the purpose of my life was trying to have compassion. Compassion was important to me because, so as I transition from this life to the next, I hope you friends and family connect with ca compassion in this and this and this way. You know, it could be really basic, but... Um, you know, have a think about that or what some kind of last minute imprints you can leave. Um, so next week, I'm going to give you some Buddhist prayers and some Buddhist practices. And I'm guessing one or two of them will, will resonate for you, or it'll remind you of poems that you've always loved or songs that you've always loved and things to kind of have on your list. And then we've got purpose projects. Yes, and um, I guess, you know, I've covered most of this, but the main thing here is to think about what's one going to keep you connected to your spiritual practice and to your motivation for life, two, what is going to be of benefit to them when you're gone. And so handwritten messages, I tell you what, people treasure those, especially now that we type everything, you know, you, you leave your kids behind some letters, I mean, goodness, you know, they're going to they're gonna weep, but they're going to love it, and they're going to reread it, and maybe they're going to frame it. You know, th these sort of things are so precious for people. Um, and again, recording yourself, um, like reciting stories and songs or like life lessons, you know. You could just start making a little list on your phone of, here's things I've noticed about people, you know, and your friends and family listening to them later will be like, oh my gosh, that is so like them, and they'll laugh and remember you. Um, I found that when I um, am doing work with people who are dying, if I tell them, let's do some recordings, of course, they're awkward at first. But then I kind of, you know, invite like, who might love this? Like, what's the story you always said to your grandkids? How can, you know, can we film you doing it? Or can we record you doing it? And then they can listen to it, maybe even play for their kids. You know, it's really joyful. Yeah, so purpose projects. Okay, so these are the main things kind of for external activities. And again, there'll be time to kind of do some writing about this after your lunch break, but just kind of, you know, ideas to put in the hopper. Internal activities, more important. Yeah. Um, before I go into the internal activities, did you want to ask anything about those um, external ones? You know, just kind of, uh, if I lost anybody? Or if you um, were thinking of one that, um, that I didn't mention that you'd like to share with folks? Very quiet here. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Anyone got no? a question? It will pick you up the microphone, so. Very quiet or, um, here. Or um, additions, additions, any other things when you look at these generosity, funeral planning, purpose projects, um, stuff you've seen other people do that really um, seemed joyful and seemed really connecting and that you thought, oh, that's a great idea. It can digest. <laughs> okay, well, jump in if you think of them later. We're going to go to internal activities. Okay, so here are the sections that, um, that are really important, okay? So mainly spiritual refuge connections. Yeah, spiritual refuge connections is huge. Even if you've already decided that you're a specific religion or spirituality, when you say to yourself, take refuge or connect with your refuge, what mental processes do you go through to actually touch that? to feel held, to feel safe from your own negative states of mind, to feel released from, you know, fear, anxiety, depression, etc., or at least enough distant from them that they haven't dominated your mental experience. You know, so, so this is the sort of thing that we really, we don't have to have it perfect. We don't have to know everything about our spiritual refuge or our purpose in life, but to really sit with 
so far, what's worked out, and what do I want to dig into a bit deeper? And then we have these, um, and so we'll come back to that. And then we have these preparation meditations, as I mentioned, mainly the nine points, um, impermanence and the eight stages. And then the purpose projects part two, which is the deep ones, which is, let's look at those old grudges and guilt. Let's just take a minute. <laughs> yeah. Um, who can we forgive? Who can we ask forgiveness of? Yeah. Often these things do crop up at the time of death and they can really interrupt your peace. Even if it's like an old grudge or an old guilt you haven't thought about in years and you squash and you put aside. There, there have been people that um, right at the last minute they want to do some sort of reconciliation or they want to do some forgiveness process. And by that time it's hard for them to speak and it's hard for them to focus. And it's, it's so heartbreaking, you know, because they can't do it then. It's too late or they can only do it halfway. Um, you know, forgiveness and purification, these aren't things that need the other party to be there. It's about you and your internal process. But you do need to have enough mental clarity to be able to kind of go through some stages cognitively and think about them deeply because um, they will kind of rise up at the last minute. So in your course materials, there is a forgiveness process that we'll look at later. Okay, so spiritual connections. You wanna say, what are your big meaning or purpose of life questions? What do I think is the point of all this? Yeah. And it could be that you've always thought the purpose of life is to give and receive love or the purpose of life is to give and receive happiness, or the purpose of life is to be a good citizen or to take civic responsibility or, you know, to be a good family person or whatever, you know, it might be that you've already kind of decided what your purpose and meaning in life is, but has it gone deep enough that it's kind of imbuing everything else that you do in your life? Yeah, just really sit with, first of all, do I know what it is? No problem if you don't, now's the time to think about it. <laughs> if you do, what's the way to bring it forward? You know, to bring it forward so it's, um, it's imbuing every activity, that it's touching every thought, you know, and really, you know, how? Repetition. How? Think about it again and again. But um, if you want your refuge to actually protect you, you have to develop it internally through deep thought and repetition. Meditation also. But deep thought and repetition sometimes is enough. Just, you know, really being with, here I am getting angry about this, or here I am getting angsty about that. What is the point of all this? Oh, right. Developing my mind to enlightenment for the benefit of all sentient beings. And then you can almost feel your mind release dramas. But it only has that effect to protect your mind if you've done the work and really thought about it. Yeah, for you to remember in the moment of truth, for refuge to kick in when it's important, you need to have thought about it when it wasn't important, when it was quiet and calm and you had plenty of time. Yeah. So what has already worked is a really good question. You know, if you know that there are many spiritual traditions you like. There are many works of art and poetry and music that you like. But at the end of the day, going to the mountains and sitting in the grass has always done the trick. Know that. <laughs> Organize that and do that and think more about why is that? Is it because you feel a sense of interconnection? Is it that you feel a sense of stillness and peace? You know, you don't have to reinvent the wheel of how you've already brought yourself peace. But think about what has already worked so that you can reinforce it and deepen it. And then what have you been drawn to but never pursued? Yeah, whether it's better communication, uh, better intimacy, better um, transparency in relationships, if it's been different levels of spiritual tradition or different aspects of the Dharma, um, just, you know, what has always been something curious to you that you've always been really like intrigued, but just haven't given it the space for. And then you ask yourself, if I had a week left, 
of my life, would I give it some space and time? Yeah. Would it um, take forefront or is it something that is a casual passing interest, but really I already know the most important thing is cultivating love and compassion in my family or the most important thing is giving back to my community or the most important thing is looking after the environment or the most important thing is developing my meditation practice to benefit others, et cetera, et cetera, right? Like whatever it is, um, you know, so just checking. And then your, you know, again, your current connections, what needs deepening. So we'll do a little writing exercise about that after lunch, but just kind of start letting it percolate and maybe talk about it in the tea break. And then we've got um, our preparation meditations. So here's your classic, right? You guys know this and it's in your course materials. Death is certain. The time of death is uncertain. And at the time of death, only Dharma helps, i.e. your internalized refuge. But, you know, unpacking that, what you're really wanting to say is, okay, it will definitely come and can't be avoided. Let's all just sit with that for a second. Yeah, whether it's a formal meditation or it's just kind of a, you know, reflective think, let's go through these. Okay. No matter how safe or well you take care of your body, you can't buy off death. Yeah, you could eat organic, heirloom, everything, perfect. You can't buy off death. Um, you know, the grandfather I mentioned, he lived to be 92. He ate tons of bacon, smoked like a chimney, drank a whole bunch, lived to 92. My dear friend, Jannie, who I loved so much, she was such a wonderful person. She died when she was 45. She did nothing but eat organic. She, you know, let her emotions flow through. She lived in Montana where the air is clean. She did everything right and she still died at 45. So, you know, we all have our stories like this. And so you have to make it personal so that it touches you. It's not gonna wait for you to finish, finish tasks. Just letting yourself break the illusion and break the lies of society that say um, your purpose and meaning will reveal themselves to you. You'll find yourself over time or, um, you know, everything's going to come together in the end. Not necessarily, right? Only if you organize it. Only if you organize it. And your lifespan can't be extended. Um, so we make excuses not to practice as if life could be lengthened. So just sit off, sit with, what are the excuses I tell myself for putting off what is important? Yeah, so whatever you decide is important, whether it's Dharma practice, whether it's community involvements, whether it's environmental justice, whatever it is, why do you put off the things that you love? Why do you put off the things that are important to you? Yeah, why is that? Yeah. And just really sit with, why do I let myself do that? Yeah, and the big, I mean, the big reason is that we're really not aware of death is coming. And we also live in this illusion of, say we've got 20 years left or 30 years left, we think that we have all that time left to do what's important, forgetting that half of that time will be sleeping or preparing for sleep or recovering from sleep or trying to sleep, but half of that time is going to be sleep related. Yeah. War with your blankets, you know, at war with your partner snoring, but you know, half your life is going to be sleep related issues. The other half of your life, so much of it is logistics, you know, coming and going and eating and going to the toilet and cleaning stuff and, you know, just like getting the job done. And then of that free time, a lot of that free time, you're just going to be mucking around doing whatever. So how much time is really left, even if you think 30 years is, is still to come, it winds up being like you've got like a year left. Yeah, in the best case scenario. You know, so we want to kind of like shock ourselves into being motivated, not freak ourselves out into paralysis. Yeah. Um, so just, you know, the first decision we come to is, okay, so then I have to practice. Whatever it is that I think is important, 
I need to do it. And then because the time of death is uncertain, then we have to, we decide I have to practice now because my best case scenario was freaking me out. What about my worst case scenario? Yeah. What if it's tomorrow? You know, who do I need to tell? I forgive them. Who do I need to tell? I love them. What do I need to do? You know, so I must practice now. And really, what anger is living in our hearts that we need to release? What grief have we been hanging on to as an identity fixture? What attachments do we not want to take with us to the next life? You know, just really like, oh, right, I need to get on top of that now. Yeah, now. And so then at the time of death, nothing helps but our spiritual practice. It's important to really sit with how little friends and family are actually going to help you at the time of death. If you're very lucky and very well organized, you'll have friends and family who are going to remind you of your spiritual path. Most people have a mixed bag of friends and family who may or may not be on board with that. You know, they might actually be quite distracting and you have to make your death about looking after them, which is a lovely offering. But to assume they're going to be there to support you, in the moment of truth, most people kind of give in to their emotional experience. Yeah, and it's good to know that rather than to be shocked at the time. <laughs> And, you know, at the time of death, our wealth is no help. You know, even if we live in a really beautiful aged care facility, even if we have great doctors and nurses, um, you know, it's not going to buy off death. It's important to remember that and that our body is of no help when we're dying. It starts to rebel on us. Yeah. And so the things that we just took for granted, we already feel that as we age, things that used to be so easy become harder and harder. At death, especially in the early moments before death, mental processes become very difficult. Yeah, it's hard to think clearly. It's hard to move the body. You know, don't plan for the way you want to practice based on how your mind is on its best day. You know, start thinking about how your mind would be on its worst day. Yeah, and so then your the third decision is then I have to practice purely without being driven by the eight worldly concerns, right? Um, you know, gain and loss, um, pleasure and pain, uh, law, you know, praise and, rep and praise and criticism, uh, good reputation, bad reputation. You know, we don't want to be obsessed with those things at the time of death because they honestly don't matter. But if you've been obsessed with them your whole life, it's going to be hard to suddenly let go in the moment of truth, isn't it? Okay, so um, thinking about those points so far, there's a lot in there, and a lot of it is intellectually easy, no problem. A lot of it you've heard before. Um, when you think about those nine points, what's you know what are some of the resistances that come up, or maybe the reasons you give yourself not to really bring them home, you know, not to really believe the truth of them. Yeah, if you think about the things you'd do differently if you knew you were going to die in a week. Yeah, what, what excuses do you do to kind of push away the idea of death? Kind of sit with that. Yeah. So, okay. If we're just thinking about preparing for death for ourselves, preparing for what kind of death? Yeah. What's the, like, what's the best case scenario death for a Buddhist? Yeah. Just based on what you know already. What's like the ideal death? Yeah. You know, before I, before I go into the whole spiel, what do you already know is, you know, like best case scenario, excellent spiritual death that's going to lead to a rebirth that's going to continue your spiritual path 
that's going to ripen the best merit, the best realizations? Like, what's your best case scenario, Death? What do you do? I know lots of you Kunzan Yeshi folks know this. What to think, how to be. Yeah, go ahead. Is it at peace? Um, from my understanding, it's like you're at peace. Um, there's the white light, you go cold at your head first, or is it feet first, and then you know you're getting a good rebirth? Um, all of those. Parts, you're at peace with your, with your mind, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Whenever you feel yourself getting overwhelmed with words, remember that the best mind to die with is a peaceful mind. Why? Why do you want to die? B besides the fact that it's more comfortable and, you know, nicer, what's the, like, big reason for wanting to die with a peaceful mind? Good readers. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Because the mind at the time of death is the biggest condition to ripen the seed for your rebirth. Yeah. So for a good rebirth, we need what are called stainless aspirational prayers, which basically means what do you want to happen? And you need a life that has some ethics and some generosity, which all of us do. We could all do more of, but we all have ethics and generosity in this life that has happened. But those are, you know, creating substantial causes for, for example, a perfect human rebirth. Right? So stainless aspirational prayers, generosity and ethics. And then the big one is a peaceful mind at the time of death. Yeah. So generosity and ethics are like planting the seeds for the good rebirth. The mind at the time of death is like what germinates the seed, what waters the seed. The stainless aspirational prayers are what link you from one life to another in a positive way. It's like the bridge. Yeah, so you've got the seed, what waters the seed, and then the bridge. So, you know, this, this framing stainless aspirational prayers, you know, it's just something as simple as whatever happens next, may it be of benefit to others. Whatever happens next, may I continue my spiritual path. Simple as that. And you frame it in words that you know will resonate for you. And these can be words then you say to yourself every time you go to sleep. Because going to sleep is very similar to dying. You go through the eight stages and you go into a dreamlike illusory experience. It's very much like dying and intermediate state. The intermediate state is very much like your dream state. Like your dream state, sometimes you know that you're dreaming. Yeah. And in the bardo, sometimes you know you're in the bardo. And sometimes you don't. Sometimes you believe all the projections. You believe the bliss. You believe the nightmares. You believe everything. And if you're starting to train your mind in seeing a projection as a projection, then you're going to be able to maintain clarity through the bardo to your next rebirth. So then even if you die badly, you can do some transformation in the bardo. Yeah, so it's not like the end of the story. And that's why we do so many practices for folks in the bardo is just in case they had a rough death and they didn't die with a particularly peaceful mind, we can um, help them in that transition period. Yeah. So just take a minute and think, all right, if as I lay dying, what are my last thoughts? As I lay dying, what are my last thoughts? What's going to create that bridge from the good ethics and generosity of my life to my next life. What's my bridge? And so for a card-carrying Buddhist, um, it is a really good idea to think, I would like to be reborn in Amitabha's pure land. Yeah, the pure land Buddhists, right? The Chinese tradition, they've really got that right. Why the Amitabha's pure land? Because that is a pure land that you can be reborn into even as an ordinary being with no realizations. Yeah, you don't have to be anything special. You don't have to have anything organized. All you need is some generosity and ethics seeds and wanting to be there. Yeah. So what is a pure land? You know, how is it different to maybe Christian idea of heaven? And it's, it's quite similar, but it's kind of like heaven that is also school <laughs> or heaven that is also a retreat center or heaven that is also a place where you're working, which 
um, you know, from what I know about some schools of uh, Protestant traditions like Methodists, like really progressive Methodists, they kind of have that similar idea that heaven is maybe a place where you still have work to do, but you're just happy about it. Yeah. <laughs> but a pure land is something that it sounds selfish to want to be reborn in a pure land. It sounds like the great bodhisattva always wants to be reborn in a samsaric environment. A great bodhisattva always wants to come back to earth, even in the worst wars and the worst tragedies and be, be of benefit to others. And of course we do. And if we're reborn in a pure land, we're actually going to become enlightened probably quicker. And then we can come back into a samsaric environment as a Buddha and not cause any more disaster. We can benefit and not harm. Yeah, us at our stage, you know, imagine that we get an another perfect human rebirth on this planet in a human body. What's going to be, you know, 50, 100 years from now, right? It's going to be hot. It's going to be a mess. There's going to be floods and disasters. There might be all sorts of wars happening. There might be more pandemics. And there'll be beauty and forests and trees and things probably somewhere. But it might be kind of a disaster in 100 years. So if we get a perfect human rebirth on this earth, we want to be of benefit to the sentient beings on this earth. But if you ask yourself, if I have the exact same mind I have now in a world that is more uncomfortable than it is now, am I going to be that useful? Or am I just going to be coping? You know, I'll maybe help a few people. I'll help the people in my immediate circle, kind of like we're doing now. And just trying to get through the day. Yeah, so it is a very advanced mind that can enter into a samsaric environment and not be distracted by the samsaric environment. Not have it ripen seeds of their own negative dispositions to be not negatively influenced at all by samsara, you need to be out of samsara. Yeah, you need to have a mind that is not samsaric and ideally the mind of a Buddha. So remember that samsara is the five aggregates, right? It's not a place, but the place of samsara is created by the projections of the five aggregates or by the projections particularly of a samsaric mind. Yeah. So for a Buddha, they can see the samsaric environment that is conditions for suffering for sentient beings, while at the same time seeing all the beauty and the lack of inherent existence and the Buddha nature of everyone. They can see all of that all at the same time. For even a very advanced bodhisattva, they know what the illusion is, but they're not necessarily able to see through the illusion in every moment. They see through it only when they're in meditative equipoise. And then that informs how they are when they're not in meditative equipoise. So it's like they've seen through the illusion. So then when it appears again, they're less likely to believe it. But just like us, if we go to a scary movie, we know it's a scary movie and it's just a movie. But still, if a scary monster jumps out at us and we're not really centered or mindful in that moment, we might still go eek, even though we know it's make-believe. Yeah. So Pure Land aspirations are useful. Yeah, and the more you think about it, the more likely it is to come up at the right time. There's lots of um, prayers to be reborn in Amitabha's Pure Land. The Amitabha mantra is Om Ami Dewa Hri, Om Ami Dewa Hri, Om Ami Dewa Hri. And you can visualize red Amitabha Buddha at the crown of your head and just think, okay, when the time comes, take me. <laughs> when the time comes, take me. So. Tons of pure lands, tons of pure lands, but that's one that'll take anyone, right? You don't have to have special realizations or anything to be reborn in Amitabha's pure land. Okay, so before I go into other, other ideas, do you have questions about pure lands or questions about Amitabha? And then I'll go into some more secular ideas as well. Any questions? Johnson, hi, it's Annie here. Hey, Annie. Um, yeah. um, from Amitabha's Pure Land, can you actually become enlightened from there? I think um, it's not guaranteed in the same way that it is in, say, Vajrayogini's Pure Land, um, but it's uh, likely, and um, certainly the conditions will help you move closer and closer to it. 
Yeah. So some pure lands take so much merit to get there that it's kind of inevitable that you're going to get enlightened within that pure land. It takes less merit to be reborn in Amitabha's pure land, which is why it's a good bet for us because we might not have tons of merit. But um, you'll get amazing work done. And while it's not guaranteed that you'll get enlightened there, certainly you're going to get enlightened eventually and it's going to give you a good launching pad. If everyone can kind of automatically, um, in some ways, go to pure land, Amitabha's pure land, if everyone can do that, then what is the difference between samsara and the pure land, if everyone can just go there? How, is, how does it differ? Well, you can't just go there just by hoping. You have to create the cause, right? And the cause is stainless aspirational prayers as a bridge right? Wanting to go there, thinking to go there. The reason to go there is to continue your path to be of benefit to sentient beings. But also during your lifetime, you need to have practiced very good ethics as well as generosity. And then at the time of death, remember what waters the seeds is a mind that is peaceful and steady. That it particularly is thinking, may whatever comes next be of benefit to all sentient beings. And then practices to do with Amitabha. So it actually takes, you know, some mental organization to be reborn there. Um, the Powa practice that some of you have heard of is related to Amitabha. And it's basically um, an assistance for your consciousness to be transferred to that pure land. So, it, you know, while it's accessible and available to ordinary sentient beings and beings with no realizations whatsoever, you might not even be a good meditator at all. It's still accessible to you. You still have to do work to think about it and create the causes for it, right? It's not something that just like happens automatically, magically. Um, samsara is a mind that is driven by, you know, anger, attachment, ignorance, where you have the five appropriated contaminated ag aggregates perpetuated by karma and disturbing emotions. And of course, you're still a samsaric being getting reborn in a pure land, but you're no longer surrounded by all the conditions that are going to flare up your anger and flare up your ignorance and flare up your attachment. So right now, in a, quote, samsaric environment, basically an environment that samsaric beings have all projected together, which is this earth, there are so many things that can annoy us, right? There are so many things that can make us sad. There are so many things that can destroy our peace. They don't do that inherently from their own side, but they are powerful conditions because of our habituation to them, right? So if we were in an environment where everyone was working towards awakening genuinely, and we were surrounded by, you know, teachers of various levels who could help us on our path and our body didn't hurt, <laughs> it would be easier, wouldn't it? in theory, right? For some people, they need the hardship to keep them awake, you know, and that's something good to know about yourself. But, you know, for a lot of us, it's, it's like titration, right? It's, we need the right amount of suffering to be motivated to uproot the causes for suffering. But if we have too much suffering, we just can get consumed in the problem-solving process of getting rid of our suffering and our path goes out the window. So only you know how much suffering is like a useful amount for your path and how much is too much and makes you not able to focus on your path anymore. And, you know, what we want to be doing is to say whether I get reborn in a pure land or whether I get reborn in a human life or whether I'm a dung beetle, may I keep this strong intention to continue my path and to be of benefit to others. And if I wind up with a dung beetle rebirth, well, it's going to be a rough whatever year, however long they live. But hopefully my habits are strong enough that the next time I'm in a human life, I can just pick up where I left off. I'll forget a bunch of details, but the intention hopefully is strong enough to carry me. Do you remember when you first met the Dharma, the parts that already felt familiar, even though you'd never heard them before? A lot of us have that, right? Like, so maybe you heard a teaching on equanimity or interdependence and you didn't know the words or the details of the philosophy but they had the ring of truth and they had the feeling of familiarity for you and you were like oh yeah this is home oh yeah i know this 
even though you didn't know it. You know, that's your imprints from previous lives. You know, maybe you were like, I really like Tibetan art. I don't know why. I really like the look of this gampa. I don't know why. I've always been drawn to these sort of colors and shapes. It's just habit energy, isn't it? And hopefully um, it's not just the colors we're drawn to, but the philosophy, right? But um, to just remind yourself that we plan for the best case scenario and then we try and get ourselves flexible enough that whatever winds up happening is of benefit. Yeah, so you can't choose your next parents, but if you choose to live a life with ethics and generosity and you die with a peaceful mind, you're going to wind up with parents that support your practice. Yeah, you're going to wind up with ethical parents, with kind, accepting parents. So it's, it's not like um, we can be like, oh, now that I'm organized, I shall take you to seem great. <laughs> it's, it's going to be a long time before our minds are clear and organized enough to actually choose them. Um, yeah, we have to have some realizations to actually choose them. But it almost becomes as if you've chosen your next life. If you're very, very organized with your ethics and generosity and this prayer to be reborn in a way that's of benefit to others. Yeah, because there's a bunch of great parents out there, a bunch of great pure lands out there, right? So we don't have to be too specific. Yeah. But what do you guys think about that? Is that sitting well or is it kind of like, oh gosh, I want more certainty? Yeah, Teresa. I have a question for you. Um, I have a, uh, a short sadhana practice that I do in the morning and there is a portion of that practice that um, is similar to what you're describing. It isn't necessarily a pure land um, prayer, but the imagery resonates. Um, I'm just gonna read a couple of the, the, you'll probably know what it is, but I'm just gonna read a couple of the lines. Um, May the surface of the earth in every direction be stainless and pure without roughness or fault, as smooth as the palm of a child's soft hand and as naturally polished as lapis lazuli. And so it's, it's setting the stage for the actual practice, but it's very similar to what you're describing. And would that be a, a, a nice substitute <laughs> to, yeah. uh, or would you? Well, it, it's interesting because what you're describing is that like, it is very much described like a pure land, but what you're doing is saying everything that is perfect and pure and valuable that I may have attachment to, I'm offering as a symbolic gesture to say the most important thing is mental transformation. My gateway to mental transformation is the Dharma or my gateway to mental transformation is this teaching or my gateway is this Siddhana. So definitely you can use that imagery for sure. That particular prayer is more, it's an offering, but that offering is an offering of generosity, which will plant a seed, which will come in handy. <laughs> you know, so it's okay. definitely, it's related. It's very related. But um, bring prayer isn't quite a pure land request, um, but it certainly has aspects that are similar. And it doesn't have to be technical, right? Like you can just make it really, you know, make it really personal and specific to you. Uh, you know, sometimes if I'm really tired or really headachey or just, you know, not able to think clearly, it's a bit of a brain fog day, you know, those days. <laughs> sometimes, you know, when I'm walking around and I'm trying to stay mindful, the only mantra in my mind is for all sentient beings, for all sentient beings, for all sentient beings, you know, or just Omani oh, Peme Hum, Omani oh, Peme Hum, Omani oh, Peme Hum, you know, and that is enough. If it's real, if it's genuine, if it touches your heart, you know, so I'm going to throw out a whole bunch of options. Don't feel like you need to take all of them. Choose the one that resonates for you. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. It's a good question. Yep. All right. Um, any, any other uh, pure land thoughts, questions? So we're clear on um, what you need is the seed for a positive rebirth, which comes from generosity and ethics to water that seed. At the time of death, you need a peaceful mind, particularly an altruistic mind. The bridge is really an aspirational prayer that has clarity about where you want to go, even if you don't wind up going there. So you could say, I'd like to be reborn in Amitabha's pure land, but implicit in that is, I want to continue my spiritual path all the way to enlightenment. Yeah, however, that manifests. Does that make sense? Yeah, those three. 
So that's, that's the important bit to kind of get on top of. So if you're thinking about that nine point death meditation, it's just a little bit of a wake up call so that, you know, you kind of keep these things in the forefront of your mind. Remember remember how how you are when big things happen right so for example if there is a, an amazing holiday coming up or there's a wedding or there's a birth or something tragic has happened or there's been a huge argument those times in your life when there's been like a climactic peak experience okay think about times like that everything else kind of falls into its correct context and its correct size. So if you're stuck in traffic, it's like, oh yeah, stuck in traffic anyway. Because you have a bigger thing on your mind, right? Something is more important than the traffic right then. Whether it's a good thing or a bad thing, something else is more important than the traffic. It fades to its correct size. If someone is rude to you at work, you're like, oh yeah, people are rude at work. Anyway, this thing is dominating my mind. So if you can do something like having bodhicitta dominate your mind because you're remembering death is coming and I want to continue this spiritual path, of course it's great for everyone around you, but it's great for you because all this little stuff shrinks to its appropriate size. Yeah, your Wi-Fi goes down, you're like, oh, well, that happens. <laughs> right? <laughs> the deer eat your flowers. That happens in Montana. <laughs> the kangaroos eat your flowers. Um, you know, like, see, it happens. You know, it's, it, everything kind of just settles. And so if you don't have a clear meaning and purpose in your life, and you're not remembering the presence of death, and that happens to everyone, you know, we just forget about what the point is, and we forget that we're going to die. When we're in a, a mood like that, all sorts of stuff can upset us. Yeah, those days when you're just really irritable and everything annoys you. Yeah, or those days where you're just kind of like needy, empty, something filled the hole, something filled the gap, somebody entertain me, somebody love me, ah, puppy, right? Those days. Or days that you're just kind of dull and spacey and vague. <laughs> yeah, those are normal human things. And those wasted days don't need to keep happening if you're remembering bodhicitta and the fact that you're going to die. Yeah. Yeah, then you shake it off. <laughs> and you're like, yeah, and anyway, right? And you still might have brain fog and you still might feel kind of pensive and you still might be a bit grumpy, but it's like that's not dominating anymore. Yeah, it fades to the background of, sure, that's happening, but that's not really the point. If you don't have a point, then that becomes the point. Do you know what I'm saying? Right? If you haven't oriented your day, then just whatever happens becomes what the day is about. Yeah. Okay, so we'll just stop here and have a little break. Um, uh, Craig, how long do you think the break should be? How you guys having a cup of tea and everything? Yeah, is everyone happy with 15 minutes? 15 yeah. minutes? Yep. Yeah. Okay, cool. See you in 15 minutes.